In this session, uh, we're going to look at the religion of Buddhism. And you might remember from one of the sessions on Hinduism that um, in around the 8th to 6th centuries BCE, within that traditional ritual path of Hinduism, there began to be some disillusionment with that path. And so what we found or what we see is that there were some people that remained within Hinduism, but they began thinking about, approaching, practicing their Hinduism differently. And so there were these reform movements that happened within Hinduism. And the one that we talked about in lecture was the path of knowledge. But I also mentioned that there were those who actually left Hinduism and began new religious movements during that time period. And there was really kind of a surge of new religious movements during that 6th to 8th century BCE time period. But one of those new movements was Buddhism. And so that's what we're going to look at uh, in this session is the history of Buddhism and the life of the Buddha. Um, Buddhism, uh, Buddhism's founder, as you may know, uh, was a man named Siddhartha. Uh, his name was not Buddha. Uh, Buddha was a title that uh, he was given later, and we'll talk about that and what that means and when he received that title. But at birth, he was named Siddhartha Gautama. Siddhartha was his name. Gautama was a family name. He was born to, uh, into a family of a father who was a, a ruler, a king, in the area of um, Nepal, northern India, that region. And um, his mother died when he was very young. And there's, there's different stories about whether she actually died in childbirth, giving birth to Siddhartha, or whether she died shortly thereafter. But regardless, Siddhartha never knew his mother, never had any sort of relationship with his mother. And so his father uh, ended up raising Siddhartha. Eventually, he married one of Siddhartha's mother's sisters. So his aunt became uh, his stepmother. But he was raised there in the royal court. And his family was Hindu. Um, his father, the king, went to a Hindu prophet while Siddhartha was still really young and asked this prophet, to look into the future and see what the future held for Siddhartha's life. And so the Hindu prophet uh, did whatever Hindu prophets do to see into the future. And he came back to Siddhartha's father and he said, when I look into Siddhartha's future, I see two things. I see an influential leader. Of course, dad thinks, of course, he's, he's a prince. He's going to be a king. He's going to be an influential leader just like his dad. That's good. The Hindu prophet went on to say, I also see... A homeless wanderer. Well, this was disturbing to Siddhartha's father. Uh, this could not happen. I mean, he was a prince. He was going to be a king. The thought of his son becoming a homeless wanderer was despicable. That couldn't happen. And so from that young point in Siddhartha's life on, his father set in motion several things to ensure that what Siddhartha became was an influential leader like himself, and would not become a homeless wanderer. And so basically, Siddhartha became the majorly overprotected sheltered child. Uh, you, you might be familiar with how royal cities were set up um, in a lot of these Asian dynasties. And so uh, th th it, was, it was a city in itself. And there were walls around the city, and there were many palaces within the royal city. And Siddhartha never left that royal city until he was well into his 20s. Uh, his father wouldn't permit that. He had, Siddhartha had three different palaces that he lived in within the royal city. Uh, he had servants. He had anything he could want. He had every pleasure that he could want. And his, his father shielded him from any kind of negative influence in his life. Well, um, Siddhartha eventually, as, as he got older, his father uh, arranged a marriage for him, as was customary in that culture, and so he arranged a good Hindu marriage to a good Hindu girl, and uh, they married. They had a son, and the birth of this son, and, and the, particularly the naming of this son, is an indication of how Siddhartha was feeling about his life in the royal city because he named his son Rahula, which I'm sure doesn't mean anything to you if you're not familiar with the story. But the interesting point is that the name Rahula meant chained or bound. 
And in that culture, especially for ruling families, you named your children something that communicated something. It, that it gave a message. And for a, a prince to name his son bound or chained uh, was, was not typical. But Siddhartha did that. And what we see as his life begins to unfold from this point on is that that was reflective of what Siddhartha was experiencing in his life. I mean, he had everything available to him you could want. He had, like, the, really what many would see, the perfect, charmed life. And yet he felt chained. He felt bound. And so he began talking with his father about being able to see what life was like outside the royal city. Well, of course, his father didn't want him to do this because then he would lose control over the things that Siddhartha was exposed to. But his father had the wisdom to finally realize that you can't tell a 20-some-year-old man who's one day going to be the king that he can't see what's outside the royal city. And so he finally agreed to let Siddhartha leave the royal city and see life outside the walls of the city. But what he did was he said, you know, the people, they don't, they've never met you. They don't know you. So let's make it a grand affair. Let's set a day and we'll have a big parade. We'll introduce you to the people. Uh, this will be a significant event for the people of our region. And Siddhartha agreed to that. But his father also used the time for between that and the set date of this celebration to um, arrange for there to be kind of his own secret service sent out into the city. And so he still tried to monitor everything that Siddhartha was going to be exposed to. Uh, these people went out, they, they made the path, set the path that Siddhartha would go for this parade. They made sure there was nothing on that path that went against the plans that Siddhartha's father had for Siddhartha's life. And so he was still being protected, unknown to him, even in going outside the royal city. However, uh, Dad's plan ended up getting foiled, and that really set in motion kind of the conversion experience that led Siddhartha to um, founding this religion we call Buddhism. So the day came for that to happen. And, and let me say here as a side note, that um, it usually in, in my classes that I meet with, I show excerpts from a movie called The Little Buddha. And um, the, it's a movie that is, is talking about a 20th century story where a group of Buddhist monks are trying to find um, the young boy into whom their leader's mind was reincarnated, who had recently died. But... It, so as it traces the story of this young boy, it also parallels it with the story of Siddhartha. And so the movie hops back and forth between this young boy's life in the 20th century and the life of Siddhartha in the 6th century BCE. And there really are some pretty uh, good scenes in that. Keanu Reeves is the Buddha in this movie. And uh, there's some pretty good scenes in there to illustrate some of Siddhartha's experiences. So, you know, if you're looking for a movie to rent from a more educational perspective, even though it's a Hollywood movie, uh, there's some really good scenes. And, and the, the part that I always like to show in class is the part where Siddhartha leaves the royal city and goes out and meets the people. And it really does a pretty, I think, a really good job of kind of getting you in the shoes of what Siddhartha's experience was as far as what he encountered when he left the royal city. Does a much better job than what I'm about to do as I tell you that story. So um, if you have a chance to oh, see that, even just that 15 or 20 minutes of the movie, um, it's, it's really, um, it really illustrates well what I'm about to tell you as far as what Siddhartha experienced. So Siddhartha left the royal city. This major entourage, major parade, Dad, you know, they laid out the path. Everything was clear along the way. Again, sort of like how the Secret Service would probably do if the president came to town. And so they're, they're going through the city, but uncontrolled or uncontrollable uh, by the king's officers and the, you know, kind of the king's court, uh, two old men somehow found their way into the crowd. Two very old, sort of decrepit men. And 
Somehow, Siddhartha's father had shielded Siddhartha from ever seeing the effects of old age at this point in his life. And that was the first of four different things, or four different sites, that Siddhartha saw on this trip outside the royal city that had a great effect on him. So he saw these old men, and he, he turned to his servant, and he said, what's, what's wrong with those men? And the servant says, well, they're, they're old. And Siddhartha says, well, old? What's, what's old? What do you mean by old? <laughs> he hadn't been exposed to that. He'd been that sheltered. And the servant says, well, old age happens to all of us. And Siddhartha says, even to kings? So he's encountered one of the first realities of life outside the sheltered life of the royal city. Well, then... In that, uh, he, he then ends up seeing some people who are very sick and in pain in their sickness. And again, Siddhartha says to his servant, what's wrong with those people? And his servant says, well, they're sick. And uh, Siddhartha says, sick? What, what do you mean sick? And he said, well, no one reaches old age without falling sick at least once in their lifetime. And again, Siddhartha says, even kings, even that kind of pain and sickness could happen to a king. And then um, Siddhartha, in, in, in this conversation about pain, the servant had mentioned death. And so Siddhartha says, so what's death? Never seen that. And so his servant takes him and shows him uh, a group of, of Hindus who are cremating the body of someone who has died and then placing the ashes in the river. And Siddhartha watches the scene and watches the body turn to ashes. And again, he's struck by this reality that he never knew existed as far as death. And so Siddhartha encounters life outside the sheltered, protected royal city. And what he sees is that people get old, people get sick and suffer pain, and people die. And that brings pain on the mourners who are left behind. And there's, there's a lot of pain in life that he had never known before because his father had so sheltered him from all these things. Well, I, I mentioned that he saw four things. You know, he saw old age, he saw pain and sickness, and he saw death. Well, the other thing that he saw were some Hindu ascetic monks. There were five of them. And now, an, an ascetic is someone who... Um, who they, they renounce things for spiritual purposes. And these ascetics were, were men who, they had renounced everything. The only thing they owned were the robes that they wore and a begging bowl that people would put rice in for them to have something to eat. They were homeless wanderers. But as Siddhartha saw all these things outside the royal city, there was one scene... <laughs> that seemed the freest. And again, you've got to remember, this is Siddhartha who's coming into the situation already feeling chained or bound in this extravagant life that he has. And he, so he sees these homeless wonders and they seem free. They seem unaffected by all the suffering that all these other people are dealing with in life. And so you're probably starting to see the writing on the wall here as far as what happens. But despite all of Dad's hard work, um, all the effort that he's put in for going on 30 years now to protect his son, he leaves his family and he leaves the palace and he goes out and he joins these homeless wanderers. The prophet's words have been fulfilled that he is a homeless wanderer. And he does this because it seems like they have this freedom that he's been trying to find or he's, he's realized he doesn't have in the life of extravagance that he's had. So he hooks up with these monks and he spends five or six years with them. And he practices the strict asceticism that they practice. You know, he only owns a robe and a begging bowl. The, the prince now is begging for rice to eat. Um, the, he, he actually became kind of the leader of these monks. Um, he, he rose to that pretty quickly, and he was seen as maybe the most spiritual astute and the most spiritually disciplined of these monks. Um, Siddhartha tells that he would um, he'd practice meditation, 
in ways that he would go for long periods of time without breathing to show freedom from the physical body. He would lay or sleep on beds of thorns, again, to show that the focus was on the internal realities and not the external. He said that he got to where he was living on one grain of rice a day in his strict asceticism. He also says later in life, when he was looking back on that phase of life, and he was talking about that he had become so strictly ascetic that he was living on one grain of rice a day, he said that during that period of time, if you reach out to touch his belly button, you would grasp his backbone <laughs> because he was so skinny and so scrawny from just uh, denying himself even of food. Well, one day, Siddhartha passed out, presumably from hunger. And when he came to, his response was, you know, this is suffering too. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to find freedom from the suffering that people deal with in life, and I'm suffering. I don't, I don't think this is it. And so he went to his uh, five traveling companions and uh, said, I, I don't think this is the way. I think there's another way to be found, to really find freedom from the suffering that there is in life. And I'm going to go try to find that way. Well, the monks ridiculed him, basically called him a wimpy monk, but he went on his way to try to find what he thought would be a middle path. Because what Siddhartha's experience was, was he had had extravagance and luxury and everything that you could want as the prince. And he felt bound. He wasn't free. And then he had had nothing. He was stripped of all these things that he thought might have been obstacles to freedom. But he still wasn't free. He still was suffering. And so his conclusion was that there, there surely was a middle path, some sort of path of balance that could be found. And so that's what he set out to find, was this middle path. And his, his primary mode for seeking that was meditation. Not so much the strict asceticism, but a life of moderation and meditation. And so he meditated for several years, actually and another three, four, five years. And eventually, he had his enlightenment experience. And at that point, he came to know this middle path that he had been looking for, this middle path that he was sure was out there somewhere. Uh, when he had this enlightenment experience, and maybe you've seen these images of the Buddha, um, he was sitting in a meditative stance, and he was sitting under a tree that's it's, it's a type of fig tree, but it was also called a Bodhi tree. And as a result of that enlightenment experience, he, he took on the title of Buddha. And the word Buddha is really comes from the name of that tree, the Bodhi tree. But it's, that he chose that word as a word that meant someone who was enlightened or someone who had woken up. And so that's what Buddha means, is one who has woken up or one who is enlightened, one who has woken up to the truth, or one who has woken up to reality. And so he was now the Buddha. He'd had this enlightenment experience. And um, the story goes even that um, he, he battled with demons that didn't want him to tell other people about this middle path, about uh, what he had found. But he decided to go ahead and do that. And he went out and he preached his first sermon. It's called the Deer Park Sermon because it was in a park with a lot of deer in it. So he had this Deer Park Sermon. And he preached it. And after he preached this sermon about this middle path that he had found, he had five converts, those monks that he had left behind. By this point, they too had decided maybe this wasn't working. And when they heard what the Buddha had discovered, they said, this makes a whole lot more sense. And so they were the first Buddhist, the first to join with him and begin trying to find this middle path. Well, kind of just to finish out the life of the Buddha, and then we'll come back to the things he taught and how, what Buddhism looks like today a little bit. Um, the, when this happened, Buddha was around 40 years old. And um, he, he went ahead, he taught these men, and as they came to understand the middle path, then they also taught other people. And the, the main way that the Buddha spread the knowledge and experience of this middle path was by establishing... Uh, basically monasteries for these monks or communities or the word in Buddhism is sanghas and so he'd establish these sanghas 
And the monks would come and they would live in these sanghas and they would be taught and they would learn how to pursue this middle path and find this middle path to spiritual salvation, freedom from suffering in the world. Um, and so he'd set up these monasteries um, all over. And then the story also goes that his stepmother came to him one day and asked about joining this movement, being a part of seeking this middle path. And uh, the, the Buddha's basic response was, uh, no, women can't do this. Women aren't capable. Women are too weak. Women are too lustful. Um, women have too many other distractions, so women can't do this. And so the story goes that his stepmother left and went back uh, to the palace. But then sometime later, she came back with 500 other women. And they all walked barefoot all the way to where the Buddha was. And they came to the Buddha, and again they asked if they could be a part of this path. And once again, the Buddha gave the same answer. Women cannot do this. this they're not capable of doing this. Well, Buddha had a, a close disciple. I believe his name was Ananda. And his disciple pulled him aside, and he said, you know, maybe you should reconsider this. I mean, these women seem to really want to do this. I mean, in many ways, they are showing a, a, a willingness to do this beyond what many of the men have shown us. And so Siddhartha finally agreed to allow women to join this and be a part of this movement, but his response to that decision was this. He said, if this middle path, or if Buddhism, were going to survive a thousand years, now that women are a part of it, it will only survive 500 years. <laughs> but at least he let women become a part of that. And so they established separate communities, uh, you know, their own convents, their own communities of nuns that came together and also practiced this, ascetis, or practiced this path, this middle path. Um, and actually, there is a, um, there's a sacred text, the Theragata, that is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, text of sacred writings by women. And it's from women from some of these, um, these communities of nuns that established that. I mentioned earlier when we talked about the problem of suffering, I told the story of Kisigatami. She was one of those nuns that was a part of one of these communities, and she has some writings in this Terragatha collection of spiritual writings. So women also were a part, eventually, of this movement during the time of the Buddha. Well, Buddha died when he was 80 years old. Um, there's there's a, not a lot of real clarity about that. It, it seems he died of food poisoning. Um, but there's not a lot of grand stories around his death as far as the basic telling of the story. But by the time the Buddha died, um, Buddhism was throughout much of northern India, throughout Nepal, and there were all these sanghas, all these communities of nuns and monks that had been set up. And there was also this understanding that for those who didn't leave um, the normal way of life to go live in these communities, that they could gain <clears throat> spiritual favor, spiritual standing, good karma, by supporting those nuns and monks. And so there was kind of this social structure that was set up of the spirituals who were gaining spiritual freedom through what they were doing, but also of those who were the lay people who were supporting them. And so to give them rice, to help them have places to live, would gain favor for them, spiritual standing for them as far as in the karmic law. And so um, as a result of that life, Buddhism is one of the, again, one of the largest of the world religions today, uh, stemming from the teachings and the life of the Buddha. As far as we know, the Buddha never wrote anything during his lifetime, or if he did, it wasn't preserved. Um, there is, there's a collection called the Dhammapada. There's not, there's not really a Bible in Buddhism, but uh, there is this collection called the Dhammapada. And it's the earliest written collection of the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, the, his teachings were passed down by oral tradition for over 100 years. And about 125, 150 years after the death of the Buddha, um, this collection was written down. 
and that's called the Dhammapada, and so it still exists today as the oldest collection of the teachings of the Buddha. But besides, that, that's the earliest thing we have, but there are no specific writings from the Buddha's hand himself or from his lifetime. Well, we want to look at what the basic teachings of the Buddha were, as well as some of the expressions of Buddhism today, and we'll do that in our next session.